the mischievous moons of Jupiter with astrophysicist Stephen K. of UC Riverside. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week we examine the mischievous moons of Jupiter. Uh, journey with me, discovering some of the many ways the four largest moons of Jupiter have upended history, science, as well as our ideas of our place in the universe. Later in the show, we welcome Stephen Kane, astrophysicist at the University of California, Riverside, back to the show. We'll be taking a look at one of the great questions of the Jovian system. Why is it that Jupiter, which is larger than all the other planets in the solar system combined, doesn't have a magnificent ring system? Hint, it's the moons. They're troublemakers. Uh, Jupiter, one of the brightest objects seen in the night sky of Earth, has been our companion since long before the evolution of the first complex life. Ancient Greek civilizations worshipped this bright point of light as Zeus, commanding the sky and weather, along with a healthy supply of lightning bolts. Now, early Romans took the mythos of Zeus, creating their own god, Jupiter. Religion and political power merged as Jupiter, often accompanied by an eagle, was named protector and overseer of Rome. On the evening of Thursday, the 7th of January, 1610, legendary astronomer Galileo Galilei turned the gaze of his primitive telescope toward Jupiter, examining what he first believed to be stars near the planet. Galileo observed these dots moving over time. The brilliant astronomer recognized these four dots for what they are, moons orbiting Jupiter. This realization led to a far-reaching conclusion and a cathartic change in the human mindset. The idea of a universe centered both physically and metaphorically on Earth was suddenly in real danger of being disproven. The idea of planets orbiting the sun had been postulated decades before by Nicholas Copernicus, yet he waited until he was on his deathbed before publishing his findings in 1543. The findings of Copernicus found opponents on both sides of the Protestant Reformation unfolding in the early 16th century. Martin Luther claimed the ideas of Copernicus, quote, reverse the entire science of astronomy. While the Vatican banned on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres in 1616, the central idea of the heliocentric model described by Copernicus was revolutionary. Yet many of his notions, including planets carried by celestial spheres along perfect circles, fail to match observations, so the heliocentric system could still be disproved. And that's when Galileo began causing problems. In 1616, as part of the Inquisition, Pope Paul V directed the 46-year-old astronomer to not teach the Copernican system as fact. The Vatican did, however, allow Galileo to continue studying these ideas and describe them as theoretical. This papal glasnost ended in 1632 with the publication of dialogue concerning the two chief world systems by the upstart astronomer. The following year, the new pope, Urban VIII, ordered Galileo back to Rome to once again face the Inquisition. This time around, he was found guilty of heresy and was put under house arrest for the rest of his life before dying a decade later. Now, over the ensuing decades, pioneering astrophysicist Johannes Kepler refined the Copernican model and Isaac Newton laid the final nails into the coffin of the Earth-centered universe in the late 17th century. In this way, the four largest moons of Jupiter created a sea change in our understanding of the universe. 
but these moons have been causing trouble since long before the days of Galileo. They've been disrupting things since the earliest days of our solar system. Next up, we welcome Stephen Kane back to the show. He's an astrophysicist who recently found why Jupiter doesn't have a magnetic set, magnificent set of rings after all. Spoiler alert, it's the moons again. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're delighted to have astrophysicist Stephen King back on the show. He is from the University of California, Riverside, and he's recently done some fascinating work showing why Jupiter does not have a magnificent ring system. Like it should, really. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, Stephen. Thanks, James. It's great to be back. Great, great. Um, so naturally, you know, when we think of rings, the first thing that comes to mind is Saturn. But Jupiter has roughly three times the mass of Saturn, so you'd think it would have spectacular rings. Why doesn't it? Yeah, it's it's something that has uh, has bothered me for a while, uh, actually, because I mean, <laughs> um, like you said, when people think of rings, they think of Saturn. Uh, for that reason, um, I actually I, I don't know this for certain, but I suspect that Saturn is probably the most popular of the solar system's planets for that reason. I mean, if you go to Google and you did, um, do a Google search of Saturn without its rings, there's certainly uh, ways that you can look at pictures of Saturn without out its rings. And it's just this brown, boring looking ball, you know. So so the rings obviously add a, 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 a lot to the planet and it certainly as aesthetically. But um, the rings are... Uh, apart from the aesthetics, they're extremely important for planets because they tell us a lot mm. about the history of the planet, uh, the in particular the impact history and the material from which the, the moons are around it may have formed uh, because a lot of the material that has, is impacting dates back to the formation of the solar system. And so there's this whole story uh, arc uh, related to uh, the formation processes that go right back to when the, when the planets formed. Um, and the reason I said it's always bothered me is because, like you said, uh, Jupiter is significantly more massive than Saturn. Uh, and in fact, Jupiter is more massive than all the other planets in the solar system combined. So it's this dominant gravitational force within the solar system that attracts a lot of uh, impacts uh, and so uh, has many, many opportunities to have ring forming material. Um, uh, it's also uh, Jupiter is a lot closer to us than Saturn, like twice as close uh, to, to us uh, than, than Saturn. And so if it did have a substantial ring system, then it would just be uh, an, an amazing feature of, of, of the sky. So so why uh, why doesn't it go back into back to your question? Well, um, Ring formation and ring sustainability, that is how long do rings last once you have them, uh, is an extremely complicated topic. And it's something that many people have been thinking about, largely in the context of uh, Saturn's rings for many years, like how old are the, are the rings of Saturn? And it's something that we actually learned a lot about during the NASA Cassini mission. Uh, but even even after that, uh, and I discussed this in, in my paper about the competing uh, theories about how long uh, the rings of Saturn uh, have been around, and the, because they range from several hundred million years to the age of the solar system, and so there's still a lot of uncertainty there. But uh, uh, as I mentioned, Jupiter should have plenty of opportunity to f form rings, and one of the big differences. Uh, between Jupiter and Saturn is that uh, Jupiter has this incredible moon system, uh, in particular the Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Um, and these are amongst the most massive moons in the, uh, in the solar system, and they're also quite close to Jupiter. They're, they're quite close to Jupiter. They probably migrated after those moons formed, 
from the initial material that formed Jupiter migrated inwards into a very interesting orbital feature, which is uh, what we call orbital resonance. Mm. That is when the orbits of the, the moons, at least in the case of the three inner ones, Io, Europa, and Ganymede, they are in resonance, um, a, a particular kind of resonance, which is called a Laplace resonance, uh, which means that for every uh, one orbit of Ganymede, Europa orbits twice, and Io orbits four times. Uh, so there's these there's this integer connection between their orbits. So uh, you're probably wondering, okay, so this all sounds cool. What has that got to do with rings? Well, the this results in the moons them being relatively massive, them being in these resonances. It means that they're able to effectively quite efficiently scatter any material that is within their vicinity. In other words, ring material. Uh, so if, uh, if there is, say, an impact on Jupiter, there'll be debris that will form around the equatorial plane and the, uh, and the Galileans' moons, their gravity and the resonance of their orbits will very, very quickly kick that out. Um, uh, and... When we look at Saturn, like I said, it's, it's the obvious comparison is Jupiter and Saturn. Mm -hmm. Jupiter is more massive, has the Galilean moons. Saturn less massive, but has rings. Does it have a massive moon? Of course it does. It has Titan, um, uh, as well uh, as Enceladus. Uh, yes, it, yeah, but uh, um, well, so Titan is substantially further out than the Galilean moons are. Uh, uh, and so Titan does have an effect on Saturn's rings, but it's a much, much smaller effect than the Galilean moons. Enceladus, as you mentioned, is interesting because Enceladus is, is extremely small. And in fact, the, the size of Enceladus is almost at the limit of what we call hydrostatic e equilibrium. In, uh, what that means is that if it were any smaller, it probably wouldn't be round. It would be like some potato shaped because it wouldn't have the gravity to smooth the surface. But Enceladus, of course, as we know, is extremely interesting because it has a lot of water content. And in fact, the ejector from Enceladus is helping to feed the rings of Saturn. Um, uh, and so that, that that's another, another factor because with these small moons that Saturn has, uh, some of them are called shepherd moons that kind of hang around the rings. Mm. So, um, and some of them are helping to feed the rings, but these are very small uh, moons. And in fact, some of them probably formed out of the rings because that's the other process that can occur is that if you have a lot of ring material uh, and you're outside what's called the Roche limit of the planet, which is where the gravity of the planet would, just naturally tear anything apart, um, then that material can quickly form moons. Uh, but the Galilean moons don't allow that either <laughs> around <laughs> Jupiter. Uh, they just <laughs> and they just kick kick it all out. Um, so uh, it's it's interesting to see the, this this problem finally explained about why the most massive planet doesn't have also the most beautiful ring system. Wow. And of course, um, this brings to mind, you know, when we look at uh, having a large moon, first planet that comes to mind is Earth. Right. Um, so is it possible that, and just throwing this idea out there, that the moon may have prevented Earth from forming a large ring system? Or, Well, I mean, we certainly know that the so, Earth has suffered significant impacts in, in the past. Right, I mean, right. starting, of course, with the moon forming impact when Thea hit the Earth. Right. And so there was a lot of material there. A lot of debris. Um, right. and, and, that, uh, and that coalesced to form the moon. Uh, and so the moon is, is, a, is a result of that initial ring system when you think about it. but i mean that happened very very early in earth's history soon after earth formed uh since then there have been many many impacts of course we know all about the one at the end of the cretaceous um that was largely responsible for for the dinosaurs going extinct but that and and that material uh there have been some interesting simulations that have been done showing how that material not only would have formed a, a temporary ring around the earth but it would have um scattered a lot of the material 
uh, elsewhere in, in the solar system. Uh, but the, this goes back to the sustainability of rings. You can, you can, any planet can have an impact that will produce material that orbits it for a period of time. The question is, how long will it hang around? Mm -hmm. And as you were suggesting, um, the, the, the presence of a relatively massive moon is going to prevent that uh from 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 happening and so when we look it's, it it helps you to look at the moon in a new light actually because um when we look at the moon of course we see it's covered with craters now uh the craters are uh, on on the moon are uh, maybe a result of something which uh may have otherwise hit earth uh, so the moon may have shielded Earth on a number of occasions. But the Earth is a much bigger target than the moon, <laughs> and it has much larger gravity. And so if you were to guess, like if you had an, an, an incoming impact, if you were to guess, is it going to hit the moon or the Earth? It's almost certainly going to hit the Earth. And that has happened many, many times. That material being ejected, much of that material then would have impacted uh, the moon. So when we look at those craters uh, on the moon, uh, we normally think, oh, that's just stuff that ra from space that randomly hit the moon. And a lot of it is, but a lot of it is also earth material, <laughs> which has resulted from impacts on the earth. Um, and so you could think the impact, impact, many of the impact craters on the moon has been the result of it absorbing a potential ring system for, for for the earth wow that is so interesting and of course the another really cool ring system in this solar system is uranus yes Talk right a little bit about that planet and what your what your research could could mean for our understanding of, of that world yeah it's 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 really interesting to think about and one thing i i should I should make clear in case we haven't already, because you know when when my paper first came out, um, I I tried to be careful how I worded it because of course we know that Jupiter does have rings, um, they're, they're just extremely faint, and um, and so I knew that there would be a queue, a, a very long queue of people lining up to say, wait a minute, Jupiter does have rings. And that, you know, of course that's, I'm not saying Jupiter doesn't have rings. I'm saying it doesn't have substantial rings, but, but the truth is all four of the giant planets in our solar system have rings. Um, Saturn and Uranus are the most obvious of, of those. Jupiter and Neptune, extremely, extremely tenuous. And in fact, with both Ju Jupiter and Neptune, we didn't even know they had rings until we flew a spacecraft past them. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Jupiter, it was uh, Voyager uh, in uh, 1979, I believe that was, when we discovered the rings of, of Jupiter. Um, the rings of Uranus, on the other hand, have been known for a long time. In fact, it's, it's, it's interesting when you look back at the original records of, uh, of William Herschel, uh, because... Uh, it was only a few years after he discovered Uranus that he lodged with the Royal Society a report in which he thought he saw rings around Uranus. So there was, something, there was some kind of oblong feature to his observations that he, he couldn't explain. And so the <laughs> when Uranus's rings were actually discovered, because there were um, there's some, some papers in the 80s and 90s that looked at uh, stellar occultations, as definitive evidence that Uranus had uh, rings, um, uh, as well as us flying a spacecraft past them in, in 1986, of course. Um, uh, and, um, and and so th those rings have, have been known for quite some time because like I said, they're, they're reasonably substantial. What does it mean to study the rings of Uranus? Well, Uranus, I mean, if we're gonna talk about impacts, particularly mm. cataclysmic impacts, which have, absolutely altered the subsequent history of that planet that kind of level of impact um the the moon forming impact for the earth is an example of one of those cataclysmic uh impacts uh then uranus is way up if not at the top of the list of 
having suffered a cataclysmic impact in terms of solar system uh, uh, history. Uh, and, and the reason for this is because it's tipped on its side. And the leading theory for that is still that it was, it was hit by a large object. Now, the, now the moon forming, uh, object, Thea, um, I, I don't remember what, what the, what the size of that was, but it wasn't, it wasn't too big. It wasn't, uh, uh, um, uh, it wasn't something like Mars, but when we're talking about Uranus, we really are talking about something the mass of or size of Mars hitting the planet. That is quite a thing. Um, but but the interesting thing about both the rings and the moons of Uranus is the pl the planet is tipped on its side, but the ring system and the moons are also tipped on their side. They are aligned with the equatorial plane of Uranus. Uh, so that means that those those rings uh, and and the moons are probably a result of what happened the, mm -hmm. the, um, and, and may may be uh, the remaining pieces of uh, pieces from the impact or the original impact material. Now the fact that Uranus, still has its rings means that they're not being significantly perturbed by the moons uh, of, of Uranus. Uranus has a fascinating uh, system of moons that uh, are, are very geologically rich in terms of their, in terms of their history, particularly um, Miranda. If you've ever seen pictures of Miranda, it looks like a patchwork quilt. There's been something very strange that's happened to Miranda in, in the past, which may be part of this whole story. So, um, so it's, it'd be very interesting to look at the perturbations of the, uh, of the rings of, of Uranus, because if indeed they're not being perturbed by the moons, then that lends credence to the idea that they're original, that those rings do indeed date back to that, that original impact. So that's what I'm really, really interested in, in looking at in the future. Fantastic. And finally, can you, is, is this going to then be your next, the next step in your research, uh, looking at Uranus and how these, how moons could affect it? And how will you be using different data to figure that out? Yeah. Um, so that's definitely something that I, I, I do want to do. Uh, Uranus, one of the um, extraordinary things about both Uranus and Neptune is that we still know relatively little about them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not, I mean, our best data is still from the Voyager 2 flybys in 1986, 1989. And, uh, and there are plans uh, from the planetary science decadal that came out not so long ago uh, outlining the priorities of the planetary science community for the next decade. Uh, one of the top highlighted plans is to have a flagship mission to Uranus. Uh, and by a flagship mission, I don't mean just a flyby, uh, like, for example, New Horizons did for Pluto. We're talking about a Cassini uh, or Galileo-style orbiter that, that will spend a substantial time around the planet and, and give us our... Um, much more, more information about the moons and so on. But uh, we do know uh, a lot about the orbits of the moons and we know enough at this point where I can use that information to, to run my simulations. Uh, so that's something I'm really excited about doing. And uh, also the application of this to exoplanets. Uh, because one of the things I do talk about in the work as well is, well, if Jupiter is... Uh, does not have rings, and that is uh, a first-order effect of the Galilea moons, then what does that mean for planets in, in other systems? Because uh, one of the things that we're trying to still get a handle on for planets in other systems is the occurrence of uh, what we call exomoons, uh, moons orbiting ex exoplanets, and what that distribution looks like. Because if the mass of a moon system scales somehow with the, with the mass of the planet, then in other words, more massive planets have more massive moons. And if you have more massive moons, then they prevent rings. Then it could mean that uh, when we're looking for rings and moons around exoplanets, then if we're looking at 
at uh, massive planets, even more massive than Jupiter, then we may not expect to have rings. Uh, whereas uh, Saturn may actually represent what I refer to as a, as a sweet spot where you're a, a massive giant planet, but not too massive such that you've formed massive companions around you that are just going to prevent uh, the sustainability of rings. So I'm, I'm interested in looking at that further, what that means for uh, uh, exoplanet exploration. That's so interesting. Well, it's great talking with you again, Stephen. Thanks for coming back on the show. Oh, thank you, James. Nice. And that was uh, Stephen Kane, astrophysicist at the University of California, Riverside. Since the discovery of the four Galilean satellites of Jupiter, these mischievous moons have played havoc with the ideas of scientists. Until well into the disco era, the only volcanoes known were found here on the face of Earth. In 1979, the Voyager spacecraft racing through the Jovian system observed titanic eruptions rising from the surface of Io, the innermost of the four large moons of Jupiter. Io, the namesake of a mortal woman turned into a cow during a marital dispute between Zeus and Juno, found a way to get her revenge. A magnetic field driven by the motion of Io through the magnetic field of Jupiter results in lightning striking the Grecian king of the gods, so take that Zeus. Notions that Earth is alone as a water world were quickly drowned out ah, by the ocean worlds of the solar system, including Ganymede. On this moon, larger than the planet Mercury, we may find oceans ten times deeper than no seen on the face of our own world. This is also the only moon we know of which possesses its own magnetic field. Callisto, roughly the size of Mercury, was once thought to be a boring dead moon. Spoiler alert, it's not. Galileo upset the apple cart once again in the 1990s, this time in the form of the Galileo spacecraft exploring Jupiter and its moons. The Asorbiting Observatory revealed Callisto may be home to a vast ocean, making it one of the most likely places in the solar system where we might find conditions suitable for life. If one is looking to find life in our family of planets, there may be no better place to start than Europa. The first hints of water on Europa were seen by the Voyager spacecraft and further evidence was collected by Galileo. That name again? Now, water vapor has been seen rising 160 kilometers above the surface of that watery moon. The Europa Clipper, a spacecraft scheduled for launch in October 20, 2024, is readying to explore Europa up close. Scientific instruments aboard the craft will examine whether or not this intriguing world could have conditions suitable for extraterrestrial life. The first discovery of life forms on another world is very likely to come from Europa in the next few years. And that would be the greatest disruption yet from these mischievous moons of Jupiter. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, follow, and share the Cosmic Companion anywhere you fancy to do so. Join us next week as we take a bite out of the future of food in space. Talking with Lenore Newman and Evan Fraser, authors of Dinner on Mars. Come join us at our table starting on the 13th of September. It's a big table. Clear skies.